In an article on Gibraltar from, I think, 67, Burgess writes, A rock of preposterous size, with a town crowded around it. A bit of geographical Spain, sun and balconies and yellow stucco, but with British-looking bobbies in the streets. The claustrophobic atmosphere of a besieged garrison, but also a sense of immense width. On a fine day from the top of the rock, you can see the time on the town clock in African theatre. From Moorish Castle, you can find, like a lost coin, the bullring in Spanish Algeciras. The biscuit-coloured beauty of the girls. Baroque processions on Corpus Christi. An Anglican cathedral in the form of a mosque. Sherry from Jerez and tepid bitter beer from Burton-on-Trent. In 1943, I stepped ashore as an army sergeant, resigned to a kind of barrack incarceration that would end only with the defeat of Germany. Gibraltar was a grim garrison then, equipped for siege. The women and children had been sent off to safety. The lights that shone there, as they shone in neutral Spain, were a mockery of peacetime. Another Gibraltar has supervened since then, the pleasure town I visit in middle age. The third Gibraltar is neither a garrison nor a centre of tourism. It is a bone of contention that history will not bury. The Spaniards yap for it. The British hold it down with an uneasy paw. It is a colony doggedly persisting in a world that has shed the colonial principle. To the stay-at-homes who read of it in the newspapers, it is a mere political abstraction, smelling not of oranges and garlic and seawater soap, but of trouble. Gibraltar is used to trouble. The rock exists as a metaphor, long before we see it as a reality. In everyday speech, it goes on standing for strength, integrity, impregnability. And to the comfort of the British, those qualities have been reflected from the mass of Jurassic limestone onto the occupying and colonizing power. But with the coming of the atomic age, no chunk of strategic geology can impress us as in the old days of canon. The metaphor celebrates a fossil. But denuded as it is of the connotations of military and naval power, the rock is still imposing, whether as the massive full stop of the Iberian Peninsula it looms on the road from Granada, or like palpable thunder towers over the ship's deck. As a sheer thing, a tough entity slapped down in southern Andalusia, it continues to excite wonder. More than two and a half miles in length from the grim, broad face looking northward to Spain over the flat Campo to the winking light on its southern tail 
it sprawls like a living organism. I say living advisedly. It doesn't give the impression of a dead thing. Its body is fissured and arteried. It echoes with galleries and caverns, yielding fresh water. Its skin teems with flowers and herbs in the spring, after the rains and before the long, dry heat. The poorer cousins across the Spanish frontier erupt in romantic passion, internecine enmities, flamenco and bullfights. But the Gibraltarians are chiefly dedicated to the careful making of money. To be disappointed in their failure to demonstrate the temperament of Spain is to misunderstand their ethnic makeup. They speak Spanish, a rough Andalusian dialect, deficient in the S phoneme. But they are not Spanish. They are Genoese, Moroccan Jewish, Portuguese, Minorcan, Garrison English, Irish, Scottish, and they call themselves, rightly, British. There is inevitably some Spanish blood, but this has been induced rather than imposed. Traditionally, young Gibraltarians go over the border to find brides. No Gibraltarian can point to a Spanish father. Spanish is the mother tongue, but the father tongue is English. That they do not wish to go further, choosing total independence of Britain, is a puzzle and a vexation to those progressives who believe that colonialism is ipso facto a bad thing. To the Gibraltarians, colonial status has never been a matter for shame. Now, with the Spaniards eager to embrace them and reclaim their city as part of the motherland, they cling more than ever to the torn and dusty skirts of Britannia. But why do they prefer the Protestant English, with whom they have little in common except a liking for tea, chipped potatoes, football and parliamentary government, to a neighbour with whom they share a language, a religion and even a cuisine? The answer is to be found in a history that is spatialized in the ramps and passages and alleys and bastions called after long dead heroes of this tiny Raj. Spanish demands for sovereignty over Gibraltar have a ring less sinister than demented. Imperial Spain is supposed to be dead, replaced by a decent middle-class country, more concerned with production schedules than Baroque dreams. Spain conducts a mean policy of frustration and harassments. Some Gibraltarians haven't seen Spain for as much as two years. There are restrictions on the passage of commuting Spanish day labour to the rock. Communion wine and medical supplies are confiscated. When the two territories should be cooperating for their common prosperity, the niggling acts of vindictiveness, anger and irritate entrenching both Britain and Gibraltar more firmly in the common attitude of intransigence. 
concessions have been offered to Spain, but total cession is in the face of the determination of 25,000 Gibraltarians to remain British, quite out of the question. I lived in Gibraltar for three years of my youth. And while I resented that enforced expatriation, I learnt with a steadily diminishing reluctance to love the bizarre blend of disparities. The policemen wore London uniforms and spoke excitable Andalusian. Taxi drivers, forbidden by law to sound their horns, made far more noise with a hand slapping on the outside of the door. Main Street had a city gate at either end, but in the bay rode the shipping of the whole free world. The contractive and the expansive nicely balanced. The Spaniards have recently been vilifying the Gibraltarians as a racial hodgepodge with little history and no culture. Perhaps the Gibraltarians recognize this as a just revenge. The menial tasks of the rock have traditionally been done by Spaniards and the Gibraltarians have naturally tended to flaunt a certain superiority. But many of them have sucked in a love of Spain with their mother's milk. They know the language. They appreciate Spanish opera and flamenco. They used to go to corridas, religious feasts, with the same gaudy piety as animates Algeciras or La Linea de la Concepcion. They want the best of both worlds, and perhaps they feel with their... Spanish superstition, that their wish has always been opposed by history. In a world that abhors untidiness and anomalies, that wants self-determination to mean African nationalism and colonialism to be as archaic a concept as mercantilism, Gibraltar is a disfigurement, a sort of rocky callous. There are times when an Englishman, putting off the worn mask of chauvinism, can sympathise with Spain. England would be unhappy, as the Spaniards are always telling us, if Land's End were an outpost of Germany. Britons, to whom Gibraltar is one of the last of the anachronistic red spots on the map, may see the plausibility of jettisoning a territory that has no further military or naval value. But there remain those 25,000 other Britons. They remind us that ordinary human beings are perverse, that they thrive on the untidy. The anomaly of Gibraltar must give the tourist a certain quiet, aesthetic joy. Aficionados of human variety would be sorry to see it hispanicized for the sake of tidiness. But apart from all that, there's this unique race of people to whom it is a home and who are ready to defend it. It has been defended before, many times. <laughs>